welcome to this week's episode of Urban Legends, the podcast about urban legends and other mysterious creatures and facsimiles and all kinds of jazz. It's the largest on the internet <laughs> by volume. Uh, and it is uh, presented by us, Nis Furbert. I am Nis Furbert, and with me as always is... I don't know how I'm supposed to do that around. Was it um, Nis Ferbert? Keel. No, you could just do the same as me. I said, we are Nis Ferbert. Oh, okay. Yeah, do you know what? Like, some well. people think that this is rehearsed, but I think yeah, that I we mean, conclusively I proved that it isn't. I anyone could possibly come to that conclusion. <laughs> Sorry, um, you threw me there slightly, Chris. Are you upset because of the death of David Soul this week? David Soul, well, obviously that's been impacting me. Well, it has, isn't it? Because as regular listeners, if there are yeah. any, <laughs> as as people who may have caught another episode which happens to mention this in, um, David Soul posters are what most people use to ward off evil spirits from well, entering you, their homes. If you look first at the... Use, uh... First use in the Enfield Poltergeist. Yes. Where there were David Soul posters on the wall as the kids were jumping on their beds. Oh, no, sorry, possessed. Um... And so with his death, we don't know whether our wards now work anymore. You know, is this I, a I sign think he's of becoming something? more powerful. Do you think? Yeah. Do you think he sacrificed himself so that he could power up the... Power, power up the, uh, the anti-poltergeist generator, yeah. Yeah, because I was worried it was a sign that we were entering the quickening. Or, or, they, or they were going to do yet another um, version of Starsky and Hutch and he just couldn't have it anymore. They decided to enter the... Spirit Zone instead. Really? I don't know. I don't. Didn't want to work with Ben Stiller. Well, they did. I don't, I don't know. Did, who, who, would it, who would it be now? No, it'd be like Pete Davidson and fucking, Who's that? I don't know. He's the lanky lad. He does SNL. Don't he know. looks kind of like a meth head. Right. I'll look him up. He gets enough, yeah, I don't know. He's <laughs> just, he's, I'm not, I'm not massively familiar with um, Saturday Night Live comedians, but I'd, I'm just thinking like if you had, it would be like somebody from that, wouldn't it? So it'd be like, Vaguely, yeah. He doesn't look like a method. I'm sure he's a nice lad, but yeah, he's. Well, I'm not sure about that. When he's not on meth, when he's on meth, he's quite aggressive. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who young people are anymore. So. No, I I believe he's like Ariana, Ariana, Ariana (laughs) Grande's ex or something. But that's about five years ago. So. There you oh, go. Well, you haven't you got your finger on the pulse of the I know, tabloids? Tell you what, yeah. Oh, a little cut on Twitch. Some, having a little chat over got the some five year old pop coach and Having too. a little chat over the back fence to your neighbours. Oh, have you, you seen go. who that Ariana Grande is with? It's oh, he looks like a crackhead. <laughs> what tattoos? But they're popular these days, don't they? What tattoos? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at them. All the young people these days look like they're in the fucking nurtured navy. I don't know, when you're getting up into sort of like facial tattoos and stuff, I think that's... Uh, well, I mean, as someone with tattoos, I've, you know, like, I, like, are my tattoos okay in your to you and your Middle England pals? Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't hire you for a job. <laughs> yeah, but there's many reasons for that, Neil. Yeah. You've, wor- yeah, yeah. you've worked with me being a primary one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's true. Um, yeah, no, I'm not, not bothered about tattoos. It's just, yeah, I like itch to their own, isn't it? It used to be you're much more... Um... Yeah. I mean, I well, actually, because I know I say all that, but actually when I was, like, hanging out with people when I was, like, 18 and stuff, we'd, there was a lot of people, like, like you know, sort of rock scene and stuff like that. There's loads, you know, everyone, loads of people had tattoos. But I think the thing with me is I could never think of anything I particularly was wedded enough to that I wanted to get a tattoo of it. Well, how about, given the news, David uh, David Soul's face on your on well, your chest? Maybe, maybe that's the yeah, back attack. Keep the ghosts out of your lungs. Yeah. Um, well, I guess that um, you know, skilled enough artist. Yeah, I'm sure there's loads of Brighton's obviously Stand up with a massive Ben Stiller face on the back. Well, again, no. I mean, you wouldn't mind that. The original. <laughs> It'd be fine to be you wouldn't mind that. Owen Wilson. Bit of story, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oops. Slightly worse. Snoop Dogg, though, good. Yeah, I don't know actually which one. He played um... Huggy Bear. A oh, Huggy Bear, that's it. I was going to say like Raggy Bear or something. Was... <laughs> Huggy Bear, all... um, yeah. cud- Cuddly Dog. Yeah, something like that. Cuddle Wolf. Um, Who was in the original show, I wonder? I don't know. I don't know. I, sim- I simply don't know. I've never seen the original show. 
I think I've seen like half an episode. It wasn't terribly compelling. And I, yeah, I've seen half of the remake film. That's about yeah. I don't, don't think I watched. Well, I think I probably watched the bit with Snoop Dogg. Talking about um, likely talk- to be the most entertaining part. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Um, talking about TV and stuff because I know you you like watching the boob tube while I prefer reading. Yeah, that's how that works. That is how that works. It's consistent. That's the one thing we are consistent. Because mm-hmm. um, we were talking about uh, Reacher, John oh, yeah, yeah, Reacher, Reacher, John Reacher. Yeah, um, so I was saying. Reacher. So I was saying that I reckon he probably did steroids, right? And um, you said I don't know. And so I looked into it, right? Mm-hmm. And he didn't do steroids, but he did do. Uh, testosterone treatment, which I've, neither of us can really criticise him for, because as I've said on this podcast many times before, I take um, I take uh, octopus DNA to improve my libido. And Neil, you take? Um, yeah, no, I take uh, prawn DNA, prawn DNA. <laughs> to improve your pinkness. Yeah, um, yeah, nice. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, so I've uh, so um I've actually signed up. I'm gonna start and this is actually this bit's true, not that the rest wasn't. Uh I'm I'm starting the gym on Wednesday. I'll start going mm, to the okay. gym. Yeah, I'm gonna get more muscular than John Reacher. Been inspired, inspired to try and try and become more a uh, tough That's guy. That's it. Like, well, cause, cause... You also want to be filmed from a sort of perspective that makes you look about a foot taller than you really are. Yeah, because he's six two. He's not that big. Yeah, he's actually. Yeah, he's I mean actually that is big, you, but I mean you know it's the same it's, size as me, which is it's average for a Dutchman. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean he's obviously massively, massively stacked. But you've got to remember, you've got to remember as we, yeah, but it's glamour muscles. We have got farm muscles now. We could take him. Um, <laughs> but you've got, uh, you've got to um, remember that, my, like. People say, don't they, that in Hollywood, ev- like everyone's really tiny because you look better on film if you're small. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So he would, um, he probably would. T- t- He'd be very like big for Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. It's not very big for the mean streets of Port Slade, eh? But with the way they film him, it makes it look like he's towering over everyone. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's very oh. forced perspective. I mean, which is kind of what you because I think he. He's in, meant to be like six foot five. Yeah, in like the book, six, yeah. Oh, is it six? Oh, is that? Oh, that's not that big either, really. I mean, it's, I mean, it's quite Come big. Come on, what, what do you consider big then? No, I'm just saying the way that they film Eight it, foot? it looks like he's seven foot tall. Because he's <laughs> literally towers over everyone else. Yeah. Um, do you know what I mean? And, and yeah, I get that. Because the idea is he's supposed to be physically intimidating. Because that's the, apparently the author was saying that's the whole thing. When he walks into a room, everyone's like, oh, shit, you know. Yeah, um, he's meant to have um, a 55, 55 inch bust. Well, that's what it, that's in the book. So he's got big. I've never Big read tits. the book. I have seen the TV series, but yeah. it's all right and a bit of fun. Yeah, it's just a bit of you know. I want to say thing I think I'll say as well. Um, and it's got Herc in it. Yes, got Herc in it this 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 oh. go round. Yeah, and the fight scenes are actually not too bad. Quite often with a lot of these things, the fight scenes are either like just two people dancing, or it you know it looks reasonably brutal. Yeah. The um, have you seen the new Netflix thing, The Brother's Son? No, it's just come out. I've it. been, I've, I've smashed through it. It's good. It's really good. Michelle Yeoh's the sort oh, of star cool. character. It's, it's um triad thing, um sort of Taiwanese triad thing, but like one of the brothers stays with the father and becomes like a like assassin guy, and okay. the other one and the mother move to LA, and so he never really knows his dad stuff, and then the worlds collide. Ooh. No, it's really good. It's like, it, do you know what? Like, there's not one person in the cast who I says doesn't do a brilliant job. Yeah, okay. No, well, should I, well, should I have to give, check that out? He Lovely. says with his queue of all the other things. Anyway, yeah. So, Neil. No, it's you this week, Chris, I believe. It is me this week. And as I said previous week, we're going to be looking at the moon shaft. Well, Which is a new position. <laughs> you cheeky, cheeky, so and so. No, uh, the moon shaft, uh, we are going to deepest, ec- deepest, darkest Europe. It's in modern day Slovakia. Mm. So that would have previously been part of Czechoslovakia, <laughs> which was previously part of the Soviet Union, sort of. Oh, yeah, yeah. East we block. Soviet uh, USSR, but then it would have been Czechoslovakia before that. Is it Slovakia or Slovenia you've been to? 
Uh, I haven't been to either. It's been to the, I've been to the Czech Republic. Oh no, sorry, I tell you. Yeah, you have. You've I've been, been to, to the Czech Republic and I've been to Slovenia. Yeah, yeah, Ljubljana, Ljubljana. Ljubljana. Yeah, I've forgotten about that. Yeah, no, I've never <laughs> been to the one I've never been to is Slovakia. In fact, the one we're talking about today. Okay. Well, so um, what I'm going to do? Uh, so if people want to look, because I'm going to someone on Reddit has put this all together very nicely so i'm gonna i'm gonna steal off their work right but yeah, as we do but so that people know it's not just a reddit thing there's a wikipedia page for it there's lots of websites about it it's like quite well known although i had never heard of it um so yeah there's a wikipedia just like type in moonshaft and you can find it there and there's like the, the original sketches which this guy did um of because okay. basically like a 70s bomb movie well, it's earlier than that. Oh, okay. So um, this uh, this was posted by Nuff Said 007 three years ago. Oh, so, another reference to Bond. That's good. Yeah, Nuff Said Bond. Um, and it is, so the history of Antonin Horak and the Moonshaft Project. Mm-hmm. So this story caught my attention back in the 90s and I went deep into it, making contact with one of the last people to have contact with Anton Horak before he passed away. This person has now also passed away. Below is the story as it was told to me. I also have pictures and a map of the cave. These are all original copies from uh, Antonin's personal papers. So this guy, where, where all this information comes from, he had a diary and stuff. So okay, it's, yeah. it's from the pages of his diary. One other contact I made via email was with uh, a paleogeologist from Boston Uni. He estimated the age of the Moonshaft Cave to be over 300 million years old. So, so what is what is this then? Is this a, this is a cave on Earth, is it? Or it's well, a Slovakia now. Yeah, oh, it's in Slovakia. Yeah, sorry. I mean, the, the the urban legend was from Slovakia, but it's okay. So it's just like a cave in. Um, it's a weird cave, which uh, I'm just wondering why they're calling it the Moonshaft. Ground. Well, as always, Neil, you're a greedy boy. You're jumping forward. Right, okay. we'll, we'll get you there. To, yeah, you're trying to gorge yourself on the story, whereas I'm I'm going to bring yeah. it out little bits of time, like it's a tasting restaurant. Yeah, still on the amused bouche, let alone the entree. I'm, exactly. I'm going to dive into dessert. Yeah, fair enough. So. Tony Horak was born in the village of Vil de Humstadt in Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic, on July the 7th, 1897. Mm. The Horak family was in Hermannstadt on vacation when Tony was born, shortly after they returned to their home in Czechoslovakia near the German border. The Horak property had been the family's enterprise for many generations. The property included agriculture, forests and mines, It extended north to the German border and covered a vast area. (laughs) All right for some, eh? Mm. I can't even afford a flat. I was going to say, that's quite... So they were... mm. They're doing all right, yeah. Doing all right, yeah. From 1903 to 1915, Tony attended school in Prague with six months in Paris and four months in London. In 1915, at the age of 18, he joined the army to fight in the hostile... Uh, Austro Hungary conflict, and he was promoted to lieutenant in 1916 with divisional decorations. Mm. He continued in the army until 1919. His education was quite extensive, graduating from the University of Banska uh, uh, Stiavinka in 1921, the University of Prague, studying engineering in 1922. The University of Prague, studying business management in 1926, and he also earned a degree in philosophy. So he wasn't trying to get, he wasn't trying to a get back. Student. That's good. Yeah, he wasn't trying to get back to the mines and forestry work, and was he? Work. Yeah, well, you know, to, to if you got the money, to figure, well, if you can afford it, exactly. Yeah, you know, trying to find a bit of time to uh, figure out what he wants to do with his life. Hey, I'm just trying to learn about myself. Yeah, yeah. Do maybe you, maybe mines and forests aren't all there is, and armies. Yeah. How'd you sell them? 
Um, so, by 1939, the Horak family employed over 500 workers in agriculture, lumbering and mining. When the German invasion entered Czechoslovakia, uh, Horak was arrested by the Gestapo oh and placed in a forced labour camp until he escaped in 1941 and joined the Czechoslovakian forces in Slovakia. Yeah. yeah. In 1943-44, he was a member of the Army's insurgency with the rank of captain fighting in the sector Podka uh, Patska Rus. Horak's 1944 diary described the fighting in the north-central area of Slovakia and on the entry of October 21st, 1944, begins the story of his incredible discovery. Mm, okay. I mean, he sounds like he's got credentials, doesn't he? It doesn't I mean, sound yeah, like... quite an impressive CV thus far. I, mean, I must say, we're taking the scenic route, but... Hey, Neil. As you say. There's no rush. No, Sit back details. in that inflatable tyre and let the wandering stream take you to the land of enlightenment. OK. <laughs> um, so, uh, OK, and this is now we're going from the diary. All uh, right, OK. October 23, 1944. Early yesterday, Sunday, October 22nd, Slavic found us in a trench and we hid, and we hid us in the grotto. Today at nightfall, he and his daughter, Hanka, came with food and medicine. We had not eaten since Friday. And all we had had before during the last two battles was maize bread and not enough of that. Our commissary had been on its last legs anyway. The supply carriers had been dispersed by confusion and the enemy. Mm -hmm. Tough times in the trenches. Yeah. Saturday afternoon, the remnants of our battalion, 184 men and officers, a quarter wounded, 16 stretcher cases, were retreating through the snow of the north slope. My company was at the rear guard. At dawn Sunday, two 70 millimetres opened up on us at close range, about 300 metres. Having held our position for 12 hours, I ordered a gradual breakup of the skirmish and a slip off. But in our left trench position for 12 hours, uh, but in our left trench, someone became careless, sorry, and drew two direct hits, shells too wounded. Arriving there, I bumped into the, I bumped into the enemy, caught a bayonet, uh, bayonet and a bullet with my left palm and a mm. blow to my head, which put me out. Without my fur cap, it might well have been fractured. I came to when someone was pulling me from the trench, a tall peasant. He packed snow on my wounds and grinded. No, he didn't grind it, he grinned. I've got that one. But, uh, <laughs> that's what I do when I pack wounds, I have a little, yeah. little bogle. Um, then this rough and ready Samaritan grabbed Yurek, stripped off his pants, yanked a long sliver of steel from his thigh and planted him bare-bottomed and gasping into a heap of snow. Martin, with a slash across his belly, was tenderly bandaged. Building a stretcher, the peasant introduced himself as Slavic, a sheepman, owner of the pastures hereabouts. With Slavic hauling and guiding, it took us four hours to reach this cranny. Slavic moved rocks into the cranny and opened a low cleft, the entrance to this roomy grotto. Placing Martin in a niche, we were astonished to see Slovak became ceremonious. He crossed himself, and then each of us, the grotto, and with a deep bow, its back wall, where a hole came to my attention. Ooh. About to leave us, Slavic went through many of the same holy rites and begged me not to go further into this cave. Dun -dun -dun. Ooh. I accompanied him to fetch pine boughs, and he told me that only with his father and grandfather had he been in this cave, and it was a huge maze full of pits, which uh, never wanted to fathom pockets of poisonous air, and certainly haunted. I was back in the grotto with my men at about midnight exhausted. Martin was unconscious, Yurek feverish. For breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, he and I had hot water, and thank God I had my pipe. For oh, yeah. I placed warm stones around Martin and Yurek did the first watch. Miserable night. Martin at times conscious. I gave him three aspirins and hot water to sip with drops of uh, Slivovitz. 
So maybe vodka or something. I think it's a sort of brandy, like a pecan brandy or something. I could be wrong, but yeah. Jurek hobbled hungrily around the two German helmets in which we boiled water and to which I added 10 drops of Slivolitz to our breakfast. With this deluge of snow, avalanche is imminent and enemy uh, skiers roaming, Slavic may not be able to get through to us with food for days to come. And neither should I try hunting and track up this landscape while I have two immobilised men on my hands. But here we have this cave, which Slavic knows only partially. It may have been, it may have more than this known entrance, and it may contain hibernating animals. Hmm. These possibilities are mulled over while Jurek was chewing on pine bark, and as expected, he implored me to go poaching into Slavic's cave, and, I'm, and he promised to keep mum. And I was not only starved, but equally eager to find out what makes self-assured Slavic scared enough to invoke the deities. I started my cave tour with a rifle, lantern, torches, and pick. What do you think's going to be in the cave, Neil? Um, David Soul. Yeah, the spirit of David Soul. No, I was going to say, uh, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I know. John Goodman in a Bigfoot suit. Okay, well, let's read on. Let's see. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give that evens. I reckon some sort of big foot. After a not too devious nor dangerous walk and some squeezing, always taking the easiest and marking the size passages, I came after about one and a half hours to a long level passage, and at its end, upon a barrel sized hole, crawling through and still kneeling, I froze in amazement. There stands something large, like, oh, sorry, there stands something like a large black silo framed in white. Ooh. Regaining breath, I thought that this was bizarre. A natural wall or a curtain of black salt or ice or lava. But I became, but I became perplexed, then awestruck when I saw that it was a, uh, that it is a glass smooth flank of a seemingly man-made structure which reaches into the rocks on all sides. Beautifully cylindrically curved, it indicates a huge body with a diameter of around 25 metres. Where this structure and the rocks meet, large stalagmites and stalactites form that glittering, glittering white frame. So it's like in the wall and there's like stalactites, stalactites around the sides of it, so it looks like a frame, I guess. Yeah, I think he stumbled across an early apple store. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Um, so the warm is uh, uniformly blue blackish its material seems to combine properties of steel, flint rubber the pick, is, uh, the pick made no marks and bounced off vigorously Ooh. even the thought of a tower sized artefact embedded in the rock in the middle of an obscure mountain in a wild region where not even legends know about this ruins mining industries Overgrown with an age-old cave deposit, it is, is bewildering. The fact, uh, the fact is appalling. Mm. Um, interesting way to phrase all of that. Okay. He's obviously um, a Lovecraftian fan. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> gone to sort of horror. I mean, yeah, it's unusual. But... You've got to remember as well, this will be tra a translate, won't it? Yeah, fair enough. From old, old Czech. Um, not immediately discernible, a crack in the wall appears from below, around 20 to 25 centimetres wide, tapers off and disappears into the cave ceiling, 2 to 5 centimetres wide. Its insides, right and left, are pitch black and have fish shape, sharp valleys and crests. The crack's bottom is rather smooth, uh, there's a smooth trough of yellow limestone and drops very steeply, about 60 degrees, into the wall. I uh, I threw a lighted torch. Um, what to say? I threw a lighted torch through. Okay. Is there it, some sort of entrance there? Yeah. A crack in the rock, I think he's saying, yeah. 
It fell and extinguished with loud uh, cracklings and hissings, as if white, white hot plowshare were dropped into a bucket. We all know what that's like. Mm. Well, I've seen a lot of those movies where they, you know, okay. shove a sword or something into a bucket. Well, wall. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to be plunging a white hot plowshare into a bucket. Not really. really. Not good for the integrity of the steel, presumably. It's not good for No, the steel will crack. The iron or whatever, yeah. Some, yeah. So do you know what? Like you get these. So like nobody studies blacksmithing anymore, is it? Well, you know that's it. You get these these Johnny Come Latelys opening up their blacksmithing stores next to the vape shops, and you know anything you get from that. Unless you can get cutlery, fine. If you want to get anything where you're going to have to use it, you know you just can't. You can't trust that they would have banged, They would have knocked out the impurities enough, and they would have taken the time not to just mm. roughly. Shove it into a bucket of water. Yeah. Idiots. Standards, it's about standards. Take an edge. Yeah. About standards. Just going to have a sip of my uh, drink here. Fair enough. To soothe my sore throat. <laughs> Driven to explore and believing me thin enough to get through this upside down keyhole, I went in, wriggling sideways, injured hands and heads below and steeply downwards. Nearly standing on my head. So I just... <laughs> <laughs> it's like probably go spelunking, isn't it? I just like I get st What's... stuck in these caves. It's where you go um, cave diving, basically. You get, they go crawling oh, right, yeah. around in these... You know, you get these caves where they, they get pot really, holding. really... Yeah, this is potholing in the way of putting it. Um, I'd hate that. Yeah. I really I'm, hate the idea of it. I'm not great with the confined spaces. So it would really, really, yeah. I like confined spaces when it's me in my bed under my duvet. That's quite... I'm fine then, but if it was me... You're confining yourself then, aren't you, basically? But, yeah, no, having to... No, yeah, getting uh, stuck or something. I'd just instantly panic attack out, to be honest. Yeah. I'd hate that. And also, I'm not built for it. <laughs> well, no, exactly. But that was the thing. Is there was, this was one of the things... That I'm John like, Reacher, for fuck's sake. Tough, tough mud or whatever. You, you crawl up something and it's deliberately designed so that you can't get all the way through. What, and someone and has to pull it, you through. And then everyone just crowds in behind you, and then you have to sort of like... Start so kicking them in the face. What do you think you're supposed to communicate? And it's like, oh, no, it's narrowed down. Get back out, get back out. Oh, well, that sounds horrible. I would start freaking out instantly. Yeah, no, that sounds bad. Like people what went instantly doing? moving backwards. And, of course, you know, it will happen. It'll, everyone will be very confused and just bumping into each other. And it's, But, yeah, that would, that, that would really freak me out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but the thing is... Psychological torture. So that... <sighs> That would be less freaky than doing it on in like two miles underground, like doing it in a tough well, no, kind of exactly, thing. Yeah. You've, mean, got your, you, you've got your oxygen, you know. Worst yeah, if you think about worst, it sensibly, they're not going to do something where you're going to come to genuine harm. They'll get you out with the jaws of life, yeah. do you know what I mean? <laughs> but under... Whereas, yeah, with some of these things, where people just fall <laughs> into some place or and, and then it's like you just get stuck in some crevice or whatever. Yeah, yeah I, I don't see the appeal, but, you know, we're all different. It's the same well, as... Like, sense of adventure, I'm sure, but, yeah, just... You know. It's the same as, like, skydiving. I don't really see the appeal of it. I mean, I can, I can understand the appeal of it, but I know I would hate it so much. Like, I would just... I could see but, that sort of more, because, like, it, worst case scenario, if something does go wrong 30 seconds later, it's all it's coming to a conclusion, do you know what I mean? So there's, there's, there's only 30 so much seconds time to think about it. Well, yeah, but you know, just go. Oh well, that's that's how, that's how that ends. Then, but you know what I mean? It's like, but getting in stuck in a hole. Would you not try and move your body shape so like, you could turn into kind of a kinetic or something, or kinetic missile, something. and try and I don't know. Well, then you just get wedged in the bus, essentially, don't you? Huh? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, if you're no, skydiving, the, the skydiving thing. Um, I would, you you, would, would you put? Would you put yourself? Is, you're, in, only, you're only going to get. You're only going to reach a speed so fast, aren't you? So two hundred and seventy or something. Yeah. So. But, you know, you know, to our mass at 270 mile yeah, an hour. I'm quite annoy a bus driver. If you, um, if you pulled yourself up tight like you're doing a bomb into a swimming pool, <laughs> into the engine block. <laughs> and the thing is as well, you don't know because you could survive because I mean, there are those things where people have fainted and um, yeah, gone if out you of go the plane and... and the parachute hasn't opened, but they've actually um, come out of it even relatively unscathed. What you want to do is you want to try even, like, you'll come out with every bone breaker, but you might survive if you can get yourself, like, into some woods, into some trees, because the trees will gradually break your fall slightly. So there you that's... go. There you go, a little tip there. No, that's what people come here for. <laughs> Skydiving survival tips. So either... Hold yourself tight into a swimming pool bomb shape and try and take out a bus, 
or do it with an accredited organisation and have a proper parachute. It's probably more the yeah. it doesn't happen. Well, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Um. So he's gone in head first. <laughs> right. So at the moment, so all, all sudden he's, he's found some weird kind he's of. He's found some big, like, cylindrical cave, thing which um, seems to be built into the walls. And he's deep dived into a hole somewhere. And he's found a, he's found a oh. hole. Cool. And he's gone head first. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, each to their own. Um, so. Uh, steeply downward, nearly standing on my head. Cramped, though my right arm with a lamp could move and extend in the crack above me. So he can do that. Yeah. So the crush got the better of me and I had to get back out quickly. Sensible. Sensible, yeah. And that became a struggle. Went out and breath regained. I was too fascinated by the whole riddle and determined to get at it. For the day, I had had enough, and I had to think about some tactics. Mm. Mm. Well, he's a military man, isn't he? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. He's, you know, he's trying to do it properly. Well, and also, he did business management, and that's all about tactics. Tony! Yeah, well, yeah. Optimising it. Hey let's, hey, let's back out, and let's, uh, let's have a 360 on it, and have a little think of some tactics of how to approach this bad boy. So we've got the, the inputs of this cave and this weird thing. What is it? That, are, expecting. are there any low-hanging fruit here? Yeah. How are we well, going to extract we... value from this for our stakeholders in the cave next door? <laughs> um, so I was in camp at about 4 p.m. Yurek had uh, washed Martin uh, and kept him between warm stones. I gave him three aspirins and some hot water with a sliver of it. Mm. To sip. Don't drink it all. Yeah. Come on. Party. It's not, it's not party, it's survival. Oh, I can't we have a party? Um, I explained to Yurek that the hunt in the cave requires... Yeah, it's a plum brandy, some of it. Oh, nice. I thought... Uh, the hunt in the cave requires much smoke, poles and a rope. Thank God Slavic and Hanka did come with provisions. When they left, I accompanied them to fetch torch bows and was back in camp at around 2 a.m. Dead tired, but finally we had eaten Yurek too much. Ooh. And I got the second Yurek. Oh, Yurek. And where's that Slivovich? <laughs> oh, Yurek. Um, October 24th, 1944. Peaceful night. Martin sipped fever tea with honey. Hope we can pull him through. Your ex posterior is not even swollen, but my head still is. <laughs> well, we had night pad we're having a bit of night paddling to keep us warm. I'm sounding quite delirious at the moment. <laughs> I think you might be hallucinating some of these things. I cut our belts, braided eight meters of solid rope. At ten AM was at the wall, anchored the rope uh, over a stick across the crack. And keeping it slung over my shoulder, forced myself again into the grim moor. Ooh. Like yesterday, the lamp, this time carbide, was on a stick ahead with the jaw above. When I came through and down, I swung freely over some void into which I could not see, and I was again rushing as if from agitated waters. And unable to turn, I feared the water-filled pit ahead and to end it literally in a headstand. Okay. So let's try and figure that out. So unable to turn, he feared a water-filled pit ahead and to end it literally in a headstand. Well, I think he, he had to go into headstand scared to the water. get his back out of the yeah. cave or something. I don't know. Or where I wriggled upwards things. back again. My clothes caught on protrusions, uh, descended on my shoulder and head and formed a plug the resulting struggle nearly caused me to be buried alive. When out and on my feet, I was shaking from exhaustion and had lurid visions. There were no loose stones above the wall, so I hacked stalagmites into short rolls and bowed them down between the cracks. Bowled them, sorry, down between the cracks. They rolled on, causing enormous echoes and knocked to a standstill. 
indicating a solid floor and a room to turn. So he got some sound bites, chopped them up, yeah. chucked them down the hole, and it seems it's got a floor. I launched the unlit torches after the stones, undressed, keeping the shirt only. <laughs> well, the thing is, the one thing you want to have if you if you're gonna if you're gonna ten, ten, if you're gonna possibly be catching yourself on protrusions is the male genitalia swinging free. Well, yeah, the most catchable object on the human body. It's, the, it's a rustic Prince Albert waiting to happen. <laughs> Um, so he undressed, keeping the shirt only, and went after the stones and torches. Already acquainted with the meanest fangs in the crack, I came through with only a few cuts, dropped a little, rolled down an incline, and was stopped by a wall which felt familiar. Uh, uh, saintly smooth like the front wall, the one upstairs. Mm. My lamp was still burning next to me, but there were confusing sounds. Lighting some torches, I saw there was a spacious curved black shaft formed by cliff-like walls, which uh, intersect and form a crescent shape and a nearly vertical tunnel rather than a shaft. I cannot describe the somberness and the endless whisperings, rustlings and roaring sounds of normal echoes from my breathing and the movement. So it sounds like it's really echoey in there, weird acoustics. The floor is the incline over which I rolled in, a solid lime pavement, and the lights together did not reach the ceiling or where these walls end or meet. The uh, horizontal distance between the curve and the back of the wall is about 25 metres. To explore further, I need more light, and my pick, which is not through the crack, must be taken apart. I left jubilant in a sort of enchantment mixed with determination to explore this large structure, which I believe is unique and singular. Mm. I mean, I don't see how this is going to help him get food, but fair enough. Well, he's then, but he just had some food, didn't he? That's true, yeah. They seem, well, I don't know, when he first started talking about the Dara, I got the impression that they, they were out of supply. Anyway, yeah, OK. Yeah, I know, but he said earlier that... He decided to do a little Blavik project on and the side. Henker, who was the, who was the, the, um, they, they the guy who owned... With them, did they? Huh? They brought supplies with them. Well, no, that's fine. We don't. We can, yeah. Yeah. No. He said they brought food. Yeah. Yeah. They that's brought. Fine. They brought some food. And do you remember? Because Jurek had too much. Yeah, that's true. It's quite. So what I will say, this is quite meandering. So I can understand why you're losing sight of the big I mean, picture uh, here. Well, I think you've you know <laughs> been involved in the Second World War trench warfare, and then suddenly you know got some injured people where they're trying to help mm. help recover, and he decided to do a little sort of hobby. Probably project on the side. Just, well, I'm no, sure but the thing is, the right like, they're, they're stuck there, right? They can't go anywhere, and they're pretty much relying on the um, uh, Slovak and Henker, so the um, farm, the herdsman and, this and his going to come back at some point, presumably, yeah. Well, he can't, he's coming back and bringing them food when oh, he can. They, oh, okay, yeah, he's coming back and bringing the food. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay, so they've got their immediate needs sorted out. Right. Sort of, yeah, apart from sort a guy of. who's got his, like, guts slit. But, I mean, yeah. I mean what are you going to do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, there might, okay. might be something in the cave. Yeah. Men's or something. So, uh, this time with my head up and with no clothes to ensnare and burn me, I was through the crack, uh, the crack fairly unscathed, dressed, smoked a pipe, <laughs> and was underway to my men. I tried to catch some bats, but caught none. Yurek was boiling potatoes and mutton, and therefore uh, inclined to excuse my bad huntsmanship. He even appreciated its hardship when he had to grease the scratches on my back and mend my shirt. Martin had a crumb of bread with uh, honeyed fever tea. After 6pm, I went for a new load of torches and was back at about 10pm. Yurek got both watches. Right, you're doing both watches, Yurek. <laughs> you're not you not, Yurek. A greedy prick. Yeah. Uh, October 25th, 1944. We had a good night. Martin seems to mend. And I'm glad that Yurek's thigh is not yet well enough for him to want to go with me to poach bats. It's better that he knows nothing about the cave secret. 
I went mm. directly to the wall, undressed like yesterday, smeared mutton fat all over me. <laughs> so he's already he's already trying to hide. It's it's do you know what? It's going up a notch each time he goes back, isn't it? It's it's getting a bit treasure of the Sierra Madre, Madre, whatever. Madre. Sierra Madre. Mm. Well, he's um first he's going like he, he's porky pig in it, like yeah. just a shirt on, and now he's going completely naked, covered in fat. Yep. So he's going through his awakening. <laughs> Get greased up. Yeah, it's his personal house. quickening. Yeah. Um, he uh, he slid my he slid his things through the crack and went in feet first, extending the carbide lamp upon a double pole with four tor- torches burning. Still, the upper ends of the cliff remained in the dark. I fired two bullets. <laughs> Good idea when you're in a cave. <laughs> Parallel to the wall. The repost caused roars as if from an express chain, train, but no impacts was visible. Then I fired a bullet on each wall, aiming some 15 metres upwards from me, and got a large blue-green spark and such a sound that I had to hold my ears between my knees, and the flames danced wildly. Assembling the pick caused more uproars. I probed the pavement and started digging where the lime is thin, in the horns of the crescent. Um, at right, it is a dry loam. Then I came about half a metre upon a pocket of enamel from the teeth of some large animal. Ooh. I took one canine and one molar and replaced the rest. Digging on nearby, the back wall has, a, uh, at about one and a half metres below the pavement, a vertical, finely fluted, undulating pattern. It seems warmer than the smooth surface. I tried with a lip and ear, and I believe the impression is correct. I could hear a distant noise like a turbine running. In the middle of the pavement, it's too thick for a trench pick. When the torches were extinguished and I was uh, in a freezing sweat, I left the moon shaft, dressed and went up to the bats area and bagged seven. Eurex stuffed them with bread and herbs, and they became as exquisite as pigeons. Mm. Slavic and Olga, the other daughter, came about dusk with hay, straw, a sheep's fleece, more medicinal herbs, uh, self-heal and stone crop, and seeds from the iris, uh, an excellent coffee substitute. I accompanied him, fetched pine torches and two long poles, and was back about midnight. Martin got the last of the aspirins, honey water, and Yurek both watches. October 26, 1944, it was a good night. I went into the moon shaft. Yeah, right. and... Two watches again. Well, you know. He's not catching the bats, though, is he? I mean, it does... Uh, you're, uh, I don't know, like, you're... Uh, do you remember um, Doberman from the Phil Silvers show? Yeah. I kind of think you're... Uh, I'm thinking of you're uh, being him. Oh, OK, yeah. <laughs> like... He's a bit, no, oh, he's eating a bit much. And then, like, right, you can, hey, hey, uh, hey, how are you doing both watches, Doberman? And I'm imagining him as Phil Silver now. Yeah. <laughs> Naked, <laughs> greased up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can imagine that sort of thing they could um, So he went to the moon shaft and continued experimenting. My longest uh, assembly of poles, the carbide light did not light the upper end of these cliffs. I fired above the lighted areas. The bullet struck huge sparks and made deafening echoes. Then horizontally at the back wall with similar effect. Sparks, roarings, no splinters, but half finger long welts, which gave a pugnant smell. Pungent smell, sorry. Then after that, I continued with my digging, uh, in the left moon horn. and So he's calling it in the moon cave because it's crescent-shaped. Okay, yeah. And saw the wavy pattern extends downwards, uh, but the right horn I found no such pattern. I left the moon shaft to probe the front wall and its surroundings. Next to the stalactites, there were some enamel-like flecks which, scraped, yield a powder too fine to be collected without glue, which I will try and boil from our pigeon's claw. You can make glue out of pigeon's claws, then. I suppose there's be gelatin in pigeon feet. I don't know. 
<clears throat> yeah, it would be. Um, I wish to obtain a sample of the particular material of the walls, but even firing two bullets into the crack upon the protrusion and hitting them, I received only ricochets, a blast of thunder, welts, and the same pungent smell. Returning to the camp, I caught some bats again, and we had pigeons. Oh, they, so pigeons is in... So that's what they're calling bats. Oh, OK, yeah. I ordered Yurek to carefully remove any trace of them and kept the claws. Uh, the Slaveks uh, arrived as usual at nightfall, bringing this time a quarter of a deer, half a kilogram of salt, a tin of carbide. Yurek took both watches. I mean, is Yurek um, getting any sleep? Well, he'll sleep during the day. Day, I suppose, yeah, fair enough. Which kind of weirdly, you would think daytime would be the time when you'd most need to have people on watch. And you, the other well, yeah, guy, you got one guy. The other guy's like injured, isn't he? Yeah, so, and yeah, and he's fucked off to the moon off cave. To his cave project. And Yurek presumably needs to get he's some got sleep. sleep at some point. But he? I would think that daytime, if there are Germans on skis yeah, prowling around, 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 that's probably when you're most likely to get caught, isn't it? Yeah, I would have thought. October 27, 1944, Martin died. Slept into death. Yurek knows his kin and took charge of his belongings. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I know him, yeah. No, I'll, make sure, I'll make sure the money gets to him. <laughs> don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, that watch. Yeah, I think he wanted his son to have that. No, don't worry, boss. I got that. <laughs> don't worry, boss. <laughs> hey, Doberman. Um, including his wallet with 643 crowns, watch with chain... And a certificate. <laughs> now we are free and ready to leave and rejoin our battalion, which is somewhere east of Kosice. With his stick, Yurik can march some 10 kilometres daily. And we have to move carefully anyways. We will start tomorrow. At 10am, I was in the cave, probing passages for a way behind the moon shaft. Looked also for ice and poisonous air about which Slavic had spoken and found none, although there may be some. Then I slipped into the moon shaft to sketch, dig and ponder and returned to the camp at around 4pm. I ordered Yurek to prepare our packs. <laughs> Poor old Yurek. Clean the weapons, boil food for seven days and have read what we will, and, uh, have read what we will not need to be returned to the Slavics. He and both girls as if the family had sensed that Martin died, came and we carried him to the dwarf pines, to the trench, where he had received his mortal wound and took turns to dig his grave, prayed and buried him in a blanket. Slavik is to set up a good cross uh, next spring, for which I gave him 150 crowns mm. out of Martin's money. <laughs> yeah. uh, Slavik briefed me as best he could about the enemy eastwards, from here, Yurek and I were back in our grotto at midnight, and he took both watches. He can sleep most of the day tomorrow. Yeah. Well, they were they. October 28, 44. Restful night, good breakfast, cut my name, etc., onto a leather strap, and together with the golden back of my watch, rolled and inserted both engravings into a glass bottle, plugged it with a pebble and a ball of clay mixed with charcoal and deposited this record in the moon shaft on top of the ashes of my torches. <laughs> like you do. Um, Mark in his territory. It? It may was, he's got back there successfully, whatever it will be. It may, yeah, but it's on Slavic's land, so... Oh, whatever. Um, it may stay there It for sounds like he's been in charge, you know, he's, he's used to ordering people about so like, yeah. Yep, now, peasant, now the war's over. I'm going down the moon cave. When the war's over, this is my cave. Yes. <laughs> this is an expedition. Get me my grease. <laughs> now go and, go and fetch Apply me. the grease to me and I shall go cave diving. I don't want to eat any more pigeons. Uh, it may stay here for a long time, possibly until the structure is completely hidden behind its curtain of stalactites and stalagmites. Slavic has no son to tell him about it, to tell about his cave mystery. No point in telling the girls, is there? His woman folk do not know about it. <laughs> and anyway, daughters usually marry into other villages. Yeah, it's going to get up. In a few way. decades, no one will know. <laughs> yeah. If I do not come back and have the structure explored, I sat there by my fire speculating, what is the structure? 
with walls two metres thick and a shape that I cannot imagine of any purpose known nowadays. How far does it reach into the rocks? Is there more behind the moon shaft? Which incident or who put this into the mountain? Is it a fossilised man-made object? Is there truth to the legends like Plato's about a long-lost civilization with magical technologies that our rationale cannot grasp or believe? I am a sober, academically trained person, but I must admit that here, between these black, uh, satiny, mathematically curved cliffs, I do feel as if the grip, as if in the grip of an exceedingly strange and grim power. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe you've just gone into like a cave somewhere. He's a bit whiffy, and then he's just surviving off a of bat for three weeks means that he's probably just losing it a little Rabies, bit. Rabies for bats. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I think I'd, I'd be coping a lot worse. So, yeah, I do. It's like a bit like you said, isn't it? I mean, this is supposedly what happened with um, John the Revelator and who wrote their book of Revelations. You know, he was in they in some little cave eating, like, you know, bread with a bit, a bit of the old mould on, a bit of Argo. Argo. Uh, just absolutely. Well, I got, yeah. Um, was that mushrooms? I got. No, um, I got on bread. That, is that, um, oh, that bread it's on wheat, yeah. wheat products, yeah. and it mm. makes people, it's a high, hallucinogen. It's a, yeah, yeah, massive hallucinogen. Um, I can understand that a uh, simple, simple but intelligent practical man like Slavic sense here some witchery. Conceal it. And also fear that if the existence of the moon shaft is ever made known, it would attract armies of tourists and all the commotion, tunnelling and blasting, hotels and commercialization, which would probably ruin their nature-bound trade and honest life. If I'm when I come... Disneyland. Yep. I want to see a slightly <laughs> weird cave. Apparently this is, you know, everyone's going to Slovakia. I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm in the sure. Victorian times, probably, but yeah. I, you know, I mean, they had got, TV got, by now, didn't well, they? Well, even you know, you got Ch- Prague's quite nice, to be honest with you. Yeah, but is it? A, is it a, lovely? Is you got it, Charles's Bridge. Yeah, you know, all the all the, uh, the oldest clock in the world. All the hen parties and what do we call them? <laughs> uh, stag parties. Stag stag yeah. yeah. Rice yeah. Center, Chris. Got someone pretending to be a Buddhist on the bridge who hands you a thing of like Buddhist prayers and you say namaste yeah. and then he goes and asks for money and you go, no, that isn't Buddhism. And give him it back. <laughs> That's what happened to me. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've had that scam at some point in the station, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Gis cash. A, a Buddhist. Buddha. Way yeah. to enchant him. Way to enchant him. It's Gis cash. Some, some tacky book of his, yeah. No, you can spare anything you've got. Yeah, no, great. Just don't yeah, well, say much inside can, and suggest well, that. I'm, I'm, well, I'm sparing his positive thoughts, mate. Yeah, and they're running out right now, this minute. <laughs> there you go. Um, if and when I come back, it will be with a team of secrecy-bound experts, geologists, metallurgists, cave experts, and if the object is of true importance for the advancement of knowledge and proper civilization, ways will have to be found to respect the Slavic's interests. On my way back to camp, I burrowed and uh, hid the crawl holes which led towards the wall. The cave may have entities which Slavic does not know, and some chance discoverer may start blasting, and in, in quotation marks, for treasure before a scientific team can get there. I was in camp after 3 p.m., and at about 5, all three Slavics arrived, bringing us some hard-boiled eggs. Oh, nice. Nice. Good walking food. Jurek asked permission to talk privately with uh, Slavic, and then Hanka was carefully sounded out by her father whether she would accept Jurek as her husband. Oh, Doberman's making a play. Nice. All right. <laughs> How does he get on? She cried and laughed, and Yurek gave her a photograph and a golden watch which his father had brought from America. Yurek is a well-to-do carpenter in Bratislava. I am invited to the wedding and will try to come. Ah, uh, well done, Yurek. Well done. Well done, Doberman. Well, after that brush with death, he's probably lying yet. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah. Make the most of life now. Starting today. <laughs> uh, to make sure, 
I gave Hanka a letter to a befriended jeweller and commanded her to get the nicest set of bohemian garnets as a wedding present. Ah, that's nice. Oh, there you go. He's paying for the rings. The Slaviks have brought their family Bible and I made some entries. <laughs> I like this Bible, but I've got a few notes. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's not how that's, no. that's mistranslated. That's... <laughs> it's no way, no, it's you not actually the, read the original. Arc didn't happen. The yeah. Um, with the hardy Slovak handshakes and Mabobo Stasia, uh, fucking hell, Pan, uh, sorry, Pan Bub Pozbanya Vas Bubsi. To boo, we shouldered our weapons. I was assuming that's goodbye. Yep, easy for you to say. We shouldered our weapons and packs and went. I mean, luckily, we don't have any listeners currently in Slovakia, so. Yeah. Um, when we entered the pines and turned, we saw Slavic concealing his cave and the girls sweeping away our tracks. The moon was bright and the snow glistened. October 30th, 44. We moved during the dark hours and only along the timber line, during daylight, camping snugly between the pine trees. We were alarmed at the sound of infantry fire. Approaching to investigate, we observed a strong group of insurgents skirmishing with a ski party of the Weimacht mm-hmm. and a Polish blue force, fasci- uh, blue police, fascists. Yeah. The fascists went soon and joining the insurgents, we were their guests for a whole day. They are a mixed group of... Uh, Hesholtz, ZOB, and DROR from the uh, Rysau region in the adjacent Poland, who had helped in our uprising, were now on their way back through immense snow to their usual sectors between Krakow and uh, Przemysl. Their physician was Rachel W., the widow of a murdered Jewish doctor, she knew and told us about the exploits of the famous uh, Jesse Freiman Banda against the Nazists and fed us uh, two fine hot meals. Mm. I mean, to be honest, like, they were brought, like, half a deer. I mean, it sounds like they ate pretty fucking well like, in the cave. Like, after a rough start, it was like, oh, and uh, he turns up with a whole deer and half a, <laughs> half a kilogram of salt. Well, look at the wiki, and actually, it sounds like... Um... Like, they, they bought them some food, but then couldn't come back immediately. I think they got snowed in for a little bit. So I yeah. think there were a couple of... There was a, a bit of time days. where they were... Um, like yeah, you mentioned they were just, they were just like drinking tea and drinking water yeah. with a bit of Slivovich in it or whatever. To keep After that. Yeah, so I think they've had some... I mean, to be honest with you, it's kind of like... I mean, I don't know... It's like is, a nice camping trip. Is this diary now just going to go on to... We get, we're coming towards the end. Okay, yeah. Because we seem to have done the, the, the moon chaff bit. But, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, you kind of like... I mean, it's pretty exciting adventure already you're kind of you know you're yeah. fighting with the resistance in, against nazi germany in the in the second world war you know i think the cave's probably the least interesting part of it to be honest with you but you know there you go you well, one of your mates died that's really sad but then another one got married yeah nice short you man know. you found a cave i found a wife so you know i found a love for uh, well, greasing yeah, myself up and pothole yeah. him so um, um, yeah, we'll, see, we'll see what comes of his cave. When these valiant Jewish fighters were marching on northwards, we had to go southwards towards Kosici, which we reached on our sixth day, and then receiving directions, we could proceed to join our battalion, which was awaiting the next offensive of the Red Army to join the end of the war. And that's the end of Horak's diary. Okay. After the war, Horak made the following notes in the back of the diary. In the very last days of World War II, on my way towards Bohemia, I revisited the place. The Slavics lived temporarily in uh, Zdar. I visited Martin's grave and looked at the cave entrance. I had taken the animal teeth I collected in the moon shaft to the curator of paleontology at uh, Uzgorod in Ukraine, and he classified them as adult cave bear, Ursus, mm. Ursus spaceless. Mm. I speculated the the crack is too small. The lump of limestone and stalactites in front of the crack would not let any debris fall through. The bear seems to have fallen into the moon shaft, which may have had a connection to the surface. I examined the mountainside above the cave and found no sinkholes or pits. 
the assumed connections towards the moon shaft. But on these very steep slopes in the uh, Tatra Mountains, rock slides could have obliterated or filled in any such connections. In early 1945, Horak was forced by the Russians to direct operations in the Piblix mines at Banksy Rada. After a short time, he refused to continue working with the Russians, and he and Anna fled to France. They're finally able to come to the United States, living in Nebraska in 1952. I was asked to give more context, uh, or in English, or to put my money where my mouth is. My contact mentioned above was Ted Phillips. Below is the YouTube presentation by Ted on the Moonshaft Project. I was as keen as Ted to put another expedition together, but time, age, and finance put a stop to it. The moonshaft is still out there waiting for an Indiana Jones to make the discovery of a lifetime. Good luck to all of you that attempt the challenge. I mean, I'm just not entirely sure what it is that they think that they found. Well, it's this way. It's, so they're, it's like, um, well, I've got like an Utah or whatever, an out of time object. It's like a, well, it's okay. like a massive, weird cylinder that looks unnatural. And it's kind of been it's been um, consumed by the mountain. Yeah, that's kind of what they're thinking. Well, that's my my understanding of it. Yeah, it's trying to get an idea it's good of exactly what what it is that's because I'm just sort of looking around the sort of wiki page here and mm. kind of like um, it sort of goes into it a little bit. And I think they um, yeah they think it might be. Oh well, there's there's various theories, but um, one one theory is it might be a slick and slide, which is uh, two enormous blocks of sandstone that move in different directions and they sort of smooth things out. So, mm. uh, you know, it, it could. I mean, I think it potentially could be a natural phenomenon. I don't know. Well, so this is the thing, right? There are really weird natural phenomenons. Yeah. That, I mean, I mean, like there are those. There, are, I mean, there are there are things that just seem otherworldly. Like there are those caves in like central and south america with the quartz crystals mm. but they're like the size of fucking buildings yeah yeah like they're huge and you just would think that now nah, like that's just made up like if you hadn't if you just heard it from like some bloke had gone in there do you know what i mean like and gone oh there are crystals the size of buildings but they're well known now and they're amazing so there's kind of lots of weird geological things that we might not know about yeah but it looks like they because obviously during the Soviet era, it was quite difficult. So he, he went, this chap, apparently, he went to uh, live in America as well. Mm. Um, so he would sort of told them, but it was only Americans who were interested in sort of following up. Um, and, yeah, I don't think they got to sort of, like, explore around the region until the 90s. Um, and they, they sort of found some areas where it might have been, but then I think a lot of the sort of caves had um, had, had partial collapses and things like that. So it's hard to know whether or not they found the original original areas and... You know how far they could explore them and all the rest of it, but uh, mm. there's also apparently there's a it could be a section of an underground network of tunnels related to mysterious glass tunnels in Babia Gora in Poland. Yeah, that yeah, so that could be it, couldn't it? But as you say, I think you know, I wouldn't underestimate what could, but you know, what can be natural phenomena. I think there's always a we always kind of have this idea that it's like oh, it's got to be something, you know, maybe it's something like you know, some. Oh, alien you know, some, obelisk, yeah, alien obelisk, or from... intelligence from a thousand years ago, some some civilization that you know that died out, but for some reason didn't um, leave any record. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I mean, he, you stumble across something that you could it could look very kind of, and I think as well, you know, the circumstances where it's kind of like you know half starved and uh, you know just been in the middle of a kind of like literally in the middle of a war and just been you know in quite a brutal battle. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Yeah, so I'm not sure I'm bothered about that bit, but I think the thing, he's not a trained geologist. Yeah, I'm just not quite sure what what to take from this, to be honest with you. Well, it's just an interesting It's an interesting little, yeah. Interesting thing uh, to have a look yeah. at, you know. We only know by looking, don't we, Neil? That's... This is true, yeah. Um, well, let's go through our scoring system. Cool. Moonshaft. So Neil, spookiness. So I don't, I don't think it's really a spooky one. This one, I think it's quite, it's in, more intriguing than sort of spooky. So tell me, look, and it seems it doesn't sound like he was. I think you know, getting buried alive or something would be awful yeah. and spooky, but that's not really it. But I get the impression it was more intriguing. 
Yeah, so there's nothing paranormal about this, really, is there? No, I didn't know whether it was going to be like a little fella living, like a little golem fella yeah, living in here I, or I something, didn't know. Or, you know, didn't or, know. or um, something else. But no, it's just something where obviously it's, uh, you know, just weird. an intriguing, intriguing kind of um, phenomenon, whether it's natural or whether it's something else. Um, so yeah, I, but yeah, I wouldn't say it was spooky so much. So I, I guess just you know the. There's the idea that it's you know you've stumbled across something that looks like it could be uncanny. Yeah, it's like I'm Lovecraftian, isn't it? Yeah, there's something there. So I'll, I'll give it a two, but because I, I think even he wasn't like scared to go in there. He, he sounded like no. he was quite eager to get gripped. Well, he's quite up happy and dive going in. naked, wasn't he? Yeah. So um, you don't, don't go think, naked if you're scared. So I, th- I think you know for me it's probably be quite spooky, but it's yeah, it's not really. It's not it. It ain't you know spookiness is not what this one's about. So no, I it. agree. I don't think this is. Um, I mean. To, <laughs> Yeah, like like you, it would be spooky for me because I wouldn't want to be greasing myself up and going through small cracks yeah. underground. Um, yeah. And it's quite, yeah, it's uncanny rather than spooky. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's... I'm going to give it a three for spookiness just because if you actually were in there and it's all dark and there's this kind of uncanny... Just judging thing, his which, reaction, do you know what I mean? He's, he's, he's more eager than kind of like, oh, I... Yeah, but he's brave, but he's braver back. than I am. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, so believability. So I don't I unless it's delirium or something, I don't I don't see what you would have to gain by making this up. No, not really. I Do think it's quite I mean? high on this one for me. Yeah, I think so. So I think he has found something and it hasn't been re- we might have misinterpreted some things, but then that's, yeah, that's but what I think, it is. It's just cool. um, so yeah, I think this one's got quite high believability because um, there's nothing, there's nothing unbelievable here. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to go nine for believability now. Yeah, I think I mean, one, off, know, one off, one off for delirium. No, exactly. <laughs> just because like, you might, have, your head might have been in a funny place, but um, yeah, I, I think there's nothing intrinsically, you know crazy here he'd you know he'd attempted to mark the place out he'd taken some notes he collected some samples that are like cave bear um yeah and and you know it, why would you just spend you know you're hiding from the vermact you really just going to decide to do a little bit of a hoax in the middle well, of the whole thing i reckon he went i reckon it was he just couldn't stand urek and he just went to the back yeah, of the cave right. and slept urek keeps farting it's just like <laughs> it's a nightmare keeps you know, spoiling, he's gonna keeps spoiling he keeps spoiling you get you get rich quick plans. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So no. Yeah. No. I don't. There's nothing intrinsically that's um, massively unbelievable here. Um, so yeah, nine out of ten for me as well. Narrative premise, Neil. Yeah, I think potentially you've got the start of something here. It, again, it's like, well, what, what is it? And you could. Um, it's probably just a you know unusual geological formation is the most likely. You know, if we're going on balance of probabilities, but. Yeah, I mean, you, I think what's I mean what's interesting here is that there's there's not an attempt to explain it's one thing or another thing, and people have kind of said, well, it could just be this, you know, fairly normal phenomenon or this thing, um, but you don't know. I suppose this is the, uh, this is probably why people like going on these cave mm. diving expeditions. It's like it's well, you know, you don't know. You could go around some corner, and all of a sudden, there's a massive like cathedral sized, you yeah. know, thing with things living in there that nobody's ever seen before. Um, yeah, so I guess it's a thrill of the unknown, isn't it, as, as well to an extent, as well as the, you know, some people like that risk-taking. I'm, I'm not, you, you know, physical risk at least anyway. So, um, but yeah, so, no, I, th- I think you could um, you could work this up because there's the good foundations and you could, you could take it any way you like. So I'm going to give, although there's, it doesn't really point towards any particular direction, but yeah, so I'll give it a, I'm going to give it a seven. Seven. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it's, um, well, it's a mystery, isn't it? A mystery is yeah. always good. And yeah, until like you say, you say what the mystery is. and then it's Well, until they point. figure out what it is, then it can, yeah. then you can, then you've got license to fuck around with it. Um, or if they even find the cave again. I mean, finding the cave is the first mystery, isn't it? Well, this is I the might, thing, um, is they're not entirely sure they have, uh, you know, or it's still accessible. Maybe you know. we should contact uh, History 2 channel. Because they're always looking for uh, looking for lost treasure and stuff, aren't they? They've got TV shows for that. We could say um, we are putting Probably together someone ex- else down. They can We're... send down Elon Musk in one of his little coffin submarines. 
Yeah, like his um, sure co- like like his coffin electric one. trucks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, you. I mean, if you were using this as a starting point to write a story, then yeah, you you know, you can do it. Um, really, it? But there's. A, there's a lack of excitement because at the end of the day, it's like a different type of rock. So yeah. I'm going to give it a, give it a five. Um, and Reach. Um, so I'd never heard of it and I found it. And then it's actually quite well-known-ish, sort of. I mean, it's got it's got a fairly, fairly um, comprehensive Wikipedia page, which not many of our things that we look at do. Um I don't know. It's a difficult one to judge. So I don't. It's not massive, is it? Um, no, I don't. I think because there's no real claim of anything particularly outlandish here. I'm not sure. It's sort of. It's no. not really folkloric. It's just. It's yeah. it's one guy's experience, and it might so, be a bit weird. So I was surprised how much there was about this on the internet, but I haven't heard of it otherwise. So I'm going to give yeah. it a three just for internet. Yeah. No. Likewise. I mean. But, I think that any any corner of that you'll you'll you you know if something's slightly uncanny then you'll find loads and loads of stuff around it but um, it tends to be fairly niche groups and I'm not convinced that this one's broadly well known. I mean I, the fact that I've never heard of it doesn't necessarily mean anything because quite a lot of these I've never heard of. But yeah, it's gonna I'll give it a three as well. That gives us an it's overall good. score of forty one. Very nice, mm. nice and comfortable. Not too good, not too bad. Just easing our way back into the new series, yeah. That's it. And I believe that next week we've got a more hilarious one, which is about a monkey man. Mm, so, I'm making claims we'll not be able to substantiate, Chris, but it's certainly one of the more unwieldy ones. Well, it's good. Yeah. after this very wordy one, which I apologise for everyone for, I didn't realise, but, um, you know. Well, you know, it's got, it's it's got to move at different paces, some of them, you? you know. That's it. I mean, it's um, interesting to see one that was kind of more realistic as well. So if you want to... If you want to get in touch with us, you can with anything you want to look at or any episode you've got any comments on or whatever um, at urbeurb.legends uh, with an S dot podcast at gmi.com or at Legends Urbane on Twitter. Um, and yeah, leave a comment uh, and give like a rating or stuff. Like none of you ever do it, but it would be nice. Hey. Um, you know, we've only, we've only put out 168 episodes. <laughs> yeah, just pick one. Just give us a comment. Um, but you know, even if you don't, I hope you enjoyed Thank it. You for and I hope, yeah, and I hope you have a good week and have a good new year. And we'll be back good. next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. It's an urban legend. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Get on with you, Greg. Oh, I'd give him my best. Quite a word, please, John.